Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so today we continue on the discussion of fluctuations of thermodynamic currents. Um, so, so last time I tried to discuss a lot about um, uh, the idea that you know there's this um, whenever you do a measurement on a system, right? You do this two point measurement. There is some uh, disturbance into the system, and um, how that affects uh, the things that we can observe. Very often we work in a regime where we avoid that in a smart way, and that regime is whenever you have a system which is connected to a large environment, and we only do measurements in the environment. And you can do a little drawing here. So all the, all our measurements are there in the environment. Right. So this is a, a a regime where you can kind of bypass some of the difficulties that we discussed last time because now. You uh, uh, the system can have plenty of quantum things and quantum coherences and so on, but you're only doing measurements in the environment. But of course, I mean, there's no free lunch. The environment will still uh, um, perturb the system when they interact, right? Uh, so of course, you still have to take that into account. Um, and so the basic idea to just kind of bridge the language with what we talked last time. Uh, uh, I mean, there were two ingredients in, in a previous lecture. Essentially, there was some unitary that was involved in the system. In this case, the unitary would just be some system environment interaction. And there was also an operator that I said we were measuring, right? There was some A operator that we measured. And in this case, this would be some environment operator, some energy of the environment or occupation of the environment. So, um, Doing this is actually quite, quite difficult, especially if your environment is having many body systems, right? So uh, what I'm gonna do here is actually kind of avoid going through this construction uh, because that would actually take a long time. There's a lot of approximation we would have to do. And I will discuss like an effective way of obtaining nice results, uh, 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 which hopefully will be a more practical and intuitive. So the results that I'm going to present today are in this paper. This is a tutorial paper. So it's a pedagogical introduction, and uh, 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 yeah, hopefully, it, um, yeah, it was written specifically to you know have a, a more pedagogical introduction to some of these topics. So what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to assume an effective a late blood master equation description for the system interacting with the environment. So I'll assume that you know the dynamics of the system. will have the form of a master equation or some Hamiltonian and some set of uh, jump operators. So if you haven't seen a master equation before, it's kind of easy to explain. So this first part is, is just the unitary dynamics that you would obtain in the system closed, and this is a, a, an effective way of modeling the, the effect that the environment has on the system, and this is described by a set of operators, LK, which in principle can be anything, and we call them the set of jump operators. Okay? Um, and the, the jump operators, they are nice because they, they um, give us a lot of intuition. So let me give some examples. The simplest example would be a qubit undergoing some Rabi oscillations with some frequency omega, and also coupled to a path that allows for photons to be uh, uh, emitted or absorbed. Now the master equation in this case would be uh, some Rabi term in simplified say resonance case, plus gamma and bar plus one, of sigma minus rho plus gamma n bar b of sigma plus rho. I'm introducing here a, a compact notation. So each of these blocks of operators, you see, they always will appear in the same shape, like L rho of dagger minus ta, ta, ta. So this whole thing, each one, usually write it as B of LK rho. So this is the dissipator with this jump operator LK. So the logic behind a qubit coupled to a path is that you can have two jumps. You can have a jump up and a jump down. 
and the things that appear in front are rays. So there, you know, the, the, the ray uh, uh, probability per unit time that these jumps might happen. And what I find nice about master equations is that you can just look at the jump operators and you can already kind of tell what is going on. In this case, you know, there's a, uh, the jump operators are taking the humidity of per down, right? So whenever there's a, uh, the action of this operator, we are essentially going to take the system up or take the system down. Um, and let me also do a, another example, which would be a uh, uh, optical cavity where photons can leak out of the cavity. So in this case, the master equation might be uh, somehow it's going out of the cavity. I don't know what's inside. Maybe you know some nonlinearity or something. And then you have some rays. And in this case, the simplest dissipator would be uh, what we call single photon law dissipator. This happens because when you have a cavity, the mirrors are semi transparent, so photons can leak out of it. And so you can have single photon losses. And so again, I can read that is a single photon loss because the operator that appears here is the annihilation operator for the cavity. I can also add two photon losses if my cavity has that. Um, oh, sorry. And cut a chew, and then you could have a D of A squared row. Okay. So, so Gabriel, the, yeah. the, the cavity uh, controls the frequency, right? But you're also saying, you're saying it's equivalent, having the cavity is equivalent to having single photon losses only, or two photon, few photon losses? Right. So, this is, a, um, um, this is a good point. So, what I can read about the uh, jump operator. As uh, something that might happen within an infinitesimal uh, um, time interval, right? So if we only consider single photon loss, we're essentially saying that you know in each kind of small time interval, the most likely thing that can happen is a single photon leaking out, right? Of course, if you if you look for a long time, many photons can leak out, but this is like a per unit time, so it's like within a small delta p. And adding a two photon loss means that you know the, the, the mirror is such that it's very common for two photons to be emitted uh, together, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, could you please explain again what was the second term of the A squared? Right. So this is just if you want to describe two photon losses. Okay. For example, if your cavity has some mechanism that allows photons to be ejected in pairs. And sometimes uh, people use this uh, in actual experiments. So this is, I'm just putting this here. Just kind of mentioned this phenomenological way of just modeling the jumps by saying what should happen. So if I put this here, I'm saying that in my model, two photon losses can occur. So there's, you know, we have small time intervals of the P, it can be that two photons just uh, disappear from the camera. Okay? And it's a two photon because of A squared, which is A and A. Yeah. That term would be some help here. The two photon loss term. Yeah, yeah, you can think about it like this. It will be a nonlinear term. Yeah, in the end. So these are just models of master equations, and I'm not going to debate if they're accurate models or not. I mean, it, the, 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 the summary of it is that you know, there are various, various situations where these are good models, and there are various situations where they're not good models. But I'm, not, I'm going to just take them for granted. And I haven't really thought about, um, you know, uh, this is just a description of an open quantum system, right? So I want to now make this connection to measurements, and that's, I think, the key point. Um, so I want to argue that when you have an equation like this, this term plays a special role in the dissipator. And the reason why it plays a special role is that we call it the jump term. And it's kind of clear to see uh, what this means. Uh, if we take the qubit example, um, we might have you know, a term like this, right? And if we assume that the density matrix, let's, let's just take for simplicity a pure state, right? So if we assume it's something like this, Uh, you know, sigma minus when it acts on the side is essentially going to lower uh, whatever excitation you have on the side, right? So this is going to be proportional to essentially zero, zero, because we're going to remove the photon from the cat. Now, we can compare this with a term like this, or, or the other one, right, uh, uh, which is rho sigma plus sigma minus, the other two terms that appear here. You see that they clearly have a different filtering. They don't lower or raise the number of limitations, they just is like a number of it's just random, right? So these terms they do play a, a physically different role uh, than the other terms in the equation. And the argument that I want to make is that 
they can be thought of as representing measurements in the environment. So that's the argument that I want to put forward is that a term like this represents a measurement in the environment. So the basic idea, if you think about a, a, a single atom that can emit or absorb absorbed photons, um, you can imagine that you have a little detector in the environment, and this would be a, a continuous detector, detector just sitting there. And if a photon is emitted, it, it will uh, reach the detector and you hit here a click, right? So, so the emission of a photon, the action of this term, will be associated to a click in a detector. And that's, that's the abstract mapping that I'm going to use. So these terms represent abstract clicks in detectors that are placed in the environment. You can ask the very reasonable question, is this really observable? Not always, but sometimes. But I'm going to assume that they are. Right? I'm going to assume that you have a bunch of detectors here and that you know to reach LK, I will have a different detector that can click when that jump occurs. So maybe for the lack of a better name, we call each LK a channel. So this would be the emission channel and this is the absorption channel. This is the single photon emission channel. This is the two photon emission channel, which is you know, called pink channel. Uh, and so you know, we assume that we have some kind of detector that uh, if there is uh, an emission of photon, it will click in the environment. Or if there is an absorption of a photon, it will also click in the environment. And again, you can perfectly well criticize this and say that not all of these jumps are detectable. That's fine. We'll actually take that into account. But for now, we're going to assume that all of them are. All of the jump operators are, in principle, reachable um, from the environment. Yep. Uh, so you're saying that the, only the terms that are LK, rho and LK, are the ones that have been right? So not the terms? Yes. And I will now make this a little bit more formal. Yeah. Yeah. But does the intuition kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Gabriel, would you include your detector in your environment? Could you then say it's also connected by the environment? I don't know. It's, it's a measurement in the environment, or it's the environment is measuring the system. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, the measurement problem issue, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so the, the environment is, is, is affecting the system, but you assume that somehow this is translated into an actual click. So there's something here with the number. Okay, so I now want to make this uh, uh, a little bit more uh, precise. And to do that, I am going to uh, uh, do the following calculation. So I will rewrite my master equation. Uh, I'm going to do the general one, right? So I'm going to just focus on this kind of general master equation. Uh, we usually write this as L times rho. L here is called the Euclidean. That's a name borrowed from classical mechanics. But what is important that is that L is this whole thing here, which is a super operator, uh, but it's linear. So it's linear in the sense that, you know, if you put rho here as a sum of two density matrices, it's like linearly on it. But it's a super operator because it acts on operators. So the, the thing that it's acting on is a matrix. And so it can act on the left and on the right. Right. So that's why we call it a super operator. Um, and I'm, the solution of this equation, uh, I mean, this is a simple linear equation, right? So the solution is, uh, I mean, this is like dx, the d is ax, right? This linear equation. So the solution is rho of d is e to the L t rho of zero, right? Even though the logic is a little bit you know, kind of abstract to think about because it's not really a matrix, it's a super operator, but still, I mean, the whole idea holds. And what I want to do is I want to look at this evolution for an infinitesimal time step, okay? So I'm going to look at uh, rho at the first time step dt, which is e to the L times dt, rho of zero, <clears throat> okay? And I'm going to series expand this and assume the dt is a tiny time step. So this will be uh, rho of zero plus dt times L, Rho of zero. Yeah. And I will now open this up. So I'm going to just, you know, insert this result. So this will be rho of zero minus IDT H 
rho of zero plus dt sum over k lk rho of zero lk dagger minus one half lk dagger k rho of zero. And now I am going to invoke uh, uh, a theorem from this, I guess, quantum information or just quantum mechanics, which is that any transformation between two density matrices, and this should be a transformation between two density matrices, right? It can always be written as a sum of what's called the cross operators, mk rho of zero, mk dagger. Okay, so this is uh, any check uh, uh, it's called the cross decomposition theorem. Uh, uh, you can always find operators mk and mk dagger such that uh, a change from one density matrix to another density matrix can be written in this form. And so we can now just kind of look here and see if we can identify what the cross operators should be. The definition of the cross operators that Right, yeah. So um the, the this cross here, I might can probably even write it down here in more detail. It says that you know if, if what is the most general way that you can change a density matrix to a density matrix? So density matrices are positive, definite operators and phase one, right? So the most general change is um if you add rho to some set of matrices like this. And they only have to satisfy one condition, which is that it's a kind of normalization condition, which looks like this, that they such one. So any, I mean, the idea is that if you change an density matrix like this for any set of matrices, doesn't matter how many you have here, the hundred, uh, that that add, add up to one, they will produce a valid density matrix. So this 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 kind of thing here will still be a valid density matrix. So I, I want to write this like this. And the reason I can actually already say it is because um, we can always think about each individual M here as an actual man. So we'll associate each of these cross operators M to a specific measurement in the system. I will see how that how that uh, uh, comes up. So uh yeah. Uh, so is that a global uh, density matrix with the universe and the uh, environment and the system, or is that a new system? This is already for the system only. Okay. So uh, the whole effect of the environment are just summarized in this jump operator. So I already I already traced over to the environment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. I think what, when we try to do this, to try to just, you know, match what should be the cross operators, it, it becomes kind of clear why the jump terms play a fundamentally different role from the other terms. Is the board here good for people over there? Yeah. Okay. So clearly we can find, you know, uh, we see this kind of left-right multiplication, right? And row and dagger. And if you look at this term, it's quite clear that, you know, it has perfectly the shape we would like. Right, so this uh, invites us to think that, that you know there will be some set of operators n k, which will be essentially square root of d t times l k, and this uh, I will assume is true for k different from zero. Right, so k one two three listing over the the um, jump up. So that that set will take care of this, right? But we still have everything else, like this term, this term, and this term. We still have a bunch of terms. Um, and we'll see if it makes sense. So this will be an answer, and we'll check that it works. If we bundle everything together into one operator that I'm going to call M0, and I'm going to uh, try to see if this operator can be written like this. Yep. Can you tell me the original? So, in terms of like the L sub K's, um, I've normally thought of it as like with L sub E, so the jump from G to G or L sub X max to E. So, right now, when you say um, like N sub K and L sub K, but K not equal to zero, 
Does that just mean? Yeah, sorry, let me, let me, let me um, um, explain that. You're right. So going, coming back to the natural equation, um, I mean, the model that I'm starting with assumes that you have a sum over certain chances with certain jump operators, right? Uh, and so I didn't really write it down, but let's assume that we have, I don't know, uh, um, NC channels. So I can imagine that this scale would run from one to a NC. The number of channels depends on your model, like in the qubit model, there were two and so on, right? But you have some number of channels, and I'm going to just label them one, two, three, four, five. So that's what I meant, sorry, for k different from zero. So uh, uh, k here being each jump operator. But now I'm going to uh, have another one, which is going to take care of the other thing. And just for convenience, I'm going to call that n zero. It's like k, it, I, it's added like an extra term. That k going from one to n c is just going to go from zero to zero. Okay, so it's not so it's like a direct jump operator. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And we'll see that this is actually the no jump. So this will be jump, and this will be no jump. We'll see that. Yeah. So I mean, let's just check that this works. Oh yeah. Is that a one minus i? Yes, this is a one one being identity matrix. So oh. yeah. So let's check that this works. Let's just do this calculation. M zero, row uh, zero. M zero matter. Um, and so this will be uh maybe I can I can uh yeah let me just do it one minus i t uh h minus i over two sum over k l t dagger k row of zero one plus i d t h plus i two sum of k and now I'm actually not going to write this down fully. You can just kind of stare at it for a second and convince ourselves that it's actually going to give precisely the terms that we want. So we want this to reproduce this thing and also this thing. It's everything that is not associated to the jump. And so if we look at it, for example, the terms of order between each of the zero, right, is going to be one times row times one. So that seems good. It's going to give us the first term. And then there will be terms of order t to the one. So there will be, for example, this times row times one and one times row times this. Right? So uh, um, if we look, for example, at the Hamiltonian term, this will be minus i dt h rho, and the other term will be uh, i dt rho h. So this will give us exactly the uh, commutator here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we can convince ourselves that this is also going to go for the other term as well. But there will also be a term dt squared, right? So when we do this thing times rho times this thing, there will be a dt squared. But we're saved here because you know the whole thing is meant to make sense for infinitesimal dt. So everything that is dt squared, uh, 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 we can neglect. Right? So this will be true. All of this is true in the limit where dt is infinitesimally small, which makes sense because that's how we actually started. We're doing this expansion for very small dt, and so this is uh, actually consistent. Okay. So what we conclude is that there is a set of cross operators that have the n k uh, for k different from zero that are jumps, and you have this n zero, uh, which we're going to associate with a no jump, right? And what is interesting is that this operator, we also usually write it as a called h effective, where h effective is this thing here. And this is a kind of a non Hermitian Hamiltonian. So, this is one uh, situation when non Hermitian Hamiltonians actually do appear, is if you just look at the uh, low jump operator. Okay. Good. So um, one important thing that we can do now is we can compute the probabilities that these different outcomes are observed. So according to the generalized measurement function, Yeah. 
if you have a set of product pairs, and k, the probability that you observe outcome k is going to be trace of m k rho m k dagger. And if you do observe k, the state should be updated to m k rho m k dagger divided by k. This is a, like a generalized metric question in terms of the cross operator. So it's the recipe for the probability that we obtain each outcome k. Uh, and uh, how we should update the state when this happens. And so the first thing we can do is we can just have a quick look into the behavior of these probabilities for our two operators, uh, mk where k is different from zero and n zero. So we see that for k different from zero, uh, we're going to have pk to be uh, dt trace of lk dagger lk rho zero. And so you see that the probability is infinitesimally small. Yeah. Uh, so when you say outcome k, we need like the the action corresponding to shock of L, like if L was A, then it would be the probability of like not overcome the game time. Yes, exactly. So for each channel, we can imagine that there's a physical significance to it. So for example, I've spoken leaving the back, of course, entering the back. So when I say the probability that this k clicks is the probability of that thing happening. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so what we see here is that this is actually infinitesimally small, right, in proportion to dt. So at each time step, this is all for a single tiny time step, the probability that the jump happens is tiny, right, it's infinitesimal. And the probability that the no jump part happens is going to be, I mean, because probabilities have to add up to one, it's just the sum of these things, and so you see that it's much, much higher, right? So with overwhelming probability, the system is actually not going to jump. It's going to evolve according to this operator m0, and there is an infinitesimal probability that the system might jump. Um, and the other thing that we can look at is the state update. So the state update should be given by this formula. And so we see that if the outcome, so let's call k equals zero. So if the outcome is k not zero, the state row zero should be updated to lk row zero lk dagger divided by trace. LK dagger LK row zero. So this is the action of a jump. And then now it kind of makes sense, right? Remember in the beginning I said that when you multiply L row L dagger, then it feels like a jump. And so this is it's consistent with that. You know, if, if a jump happens, if the outcome we observe is a K different from zero, then the system will, uh, will abruptly jump. Uh, and otherwise, if K is zero, then this will just be M zero row M zero dagger divided by trace of M zero dagger uh, M zero row M zero dagger, which is not going to be an abrupt change because this M zero is like one minus dt something. This this update is going to be a smooth thing, like a tiny change. But this one is huge, right? There is no dt here; it's just a big change. So pictorially, what we have is something like this. Here is time. Um, and as the system evolves, so I mean, let me put in quotation marks here, row, <laughs> right? Uh, but of course, we can't really plot row. But um, as the system evolves, most of the time it's going to undergo low jump evolution, which are going to be smooth, right? And then every once in a while, there's a tiny probability that every once in a while it's going to jump, right? And then this is an abrupt change, it's just going to. Uh, uh, be updated like this, and then it's going to start evolving again, and then it might jump again. And this, and then evolves, and then jumps, and then evolves, and so on. Right? So, in this one, this was an unraveling of the master equation. So, we unravel the evolution into a sequence of jumps and no jumps. Okay, does this make sense? Yeah. 
but the jumps are also not infinitely fast. So is this just a different time scale? Yeah. So within within this kind of modeling, we are assuming that they are infinitely fast. So this also probably in a trillion the jumps, so it has some bending at the corners. But I've got the comment here that the jumps, this is completely mathematically correct, but not physically, because it's not unique. So uh, there are infinitely many ways you can unravel the yeah. equation. So Gabriel chooses one, and this is legitimate. If it's not physical. Well, no, it, it's not that it's not physical. It's one choice. Yeah. And it can be a physical choice. It, it's physical if you attach count. If I can unravel without putting a method. I, I wouldn't argue that it's not physical. I mean, it's one possibility of unraveling. I'd like to talk about another one if I have time. But I mean, it's one physical possibility of unraveling, right? Uh, they're infinitely many. Nice. Some of them are, yeah, appear and, and, and they give the same answer. They give the same answer equations with very different solutions. No, they give the same evolution. I can conditional evolution. So if you were to observe this in the lab, they look very different. Then I need a counter. A counter? I need a measurement in the lab. Yeah, sure, so sure, sure. sure. So yeah. If you assume a specific measurement, then you could say that some reaction is better. But otherwise, it was more. That there's many ways you can unravel the same equation. I can write this master equation. I can unravel it in a stochastic way, and right. they don't get the same result than the average. Right. I think I think that the kind of the, the issue here is, is more like I'm thinking about this as one possible unraveling that you could actually do in the lab, not just as a mathematical fix. But I, of course, to actually connect this to the lab, you have to go to. Yeah. I just thought it was like, for example, on, on Tuesday, we're doing simulations, um, you can choose. Either the master equation solver, which will average out many different cases, you get more of like a smooth evolution, but you can also choose a Monte Carlo, which would give you like single jumps. So, would that be kind of similar to like this case where you just get some sort of rate of that execution operator and then um, it happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen other times? Whereas, like the Lindblad evolution master equation, which would be an average of many ones, which is like smooth. Is that Right, so so I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but uh, this will be closer to what in trivia would be called the Monte Carlo wave function, or Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo, where it is your right name. Yeah, but there's a difference here, and I'll, I'll come back to this in one second. There's a difference here between the, the random outcomes, such as these, these are random things, right? Uh, and, and the what's called the unconditional evolution, which is when you don't care about the specific sequence of jumps. Okay, so I'll talk that, about that in a second. I just wanted to quickly show uh, um, how this could be um, played with, I guess. Um, so let me see. I can probably need to zoom in here. Uh, so, okay, so I start with some uh, self uh, advertisement. Uh, sorry about that. But um, so we have this library called uh, uh, Melt, uh, which is kind of a you know analog of Q-tip but for Mathematica and you can uh, uh, find it in this website. I'll make sure to send this this uh, file around so that it's shared with everyone. And so let me just give one example. Um, suppose you have a qubit with some Rabi oscillation, sigma x, and the two jump operators, the two channels that I mentioned, right? Uh, now the way you would do it is you define your Liouvillian, but you define your jump operators L1, L2. So these are the LKs. Define your Hamiltonian, and then uh, a actual uh, quantum trajectory. Let me just skip here. Would look like something like this. So this would be the population of the qubit, right, uh, as it evolves in time. So you see that it can uh, uh, undergo jumps uh, up and down. Actually, I see that this is already reversed, right? Clearly, the arrows are pointing the opposite direction that they should. Sorry about that, but um, uh, essentially the idea is that in between jumps the populations are just going to Rabi oscillate up and down, right? So these are just the Rabi oscillations, but then randomly, every once in a while, they can undergo certain jumps, right? And the jumps can go up and the jumps can go down, okay? Um, now, the argument that I want to make, and I think this is an important one, is that this can actually be a physical thing, right? This is, a, I mean, you can think about this as just a mathematical unraveling of a master equation, but that's not uh, necessarily the case. You can actually observe these things in the lab. You can actually observe these clicks in the lab in certain experiments, right? So, so uh, um, uh, maybe you might not be able to observe all the jumps. For example, it's uh, if you think about you know photons being emitted or absorbed, usually you observe the emitted photons, but you don't necessarily observe the absorbed ones. So maybe not all channels are monitorable. That's fine. 
but some of them are, right? So you, you can observe actually these sequences of quantum jumps in the laboratory. Right, right. And I think this will be a big part of what I want to talk, you know, more and more, which is, you know, this is a random thing. You know, we can start building statistics and we can start taking averages in different ways, right? And this will give us meaningful things. Uh, but underlying all of these statistics is always a trajectory, right? It's always a sequence of quantum jumps. So what, what we've said so far is essentially kind of limited. I, I talked about one time step, right, one dt. And what we saw is that rho at time dt is going to be uh, a sequence of possible outcomes, rho of zero and j dagger, right? Um, now this thing here, just to get some names, this is called an unconditional evolution. I mean, in fact, be precise here, A can go from zero to N D, so it puts off of the no jump, right? Um, however, we saw that the conditional evolution is essentially, and I'm going to put a little C here to call it conditional, is that this will just be one of these terms with PK is being traced of nk rho zero and the dagger. And so this is called a conditional evolution. It's conditional because it carries with it a string, uh, sorry, a, 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 the outcome k, right? This depends on the outcome k. So you, you, you sample your k from zero to nc, right? And then this stage now depends on your choice of k. Right, so to be precise, we should probably write this as rho c of dt given k. I mean, that would be a more, uh, you know, uh, correct notation say, you know, in this case, conditioned on the fact that the outcome that I observed was k, right? But to be honest, we usually omit this just to, uh, um, yeah, for notational purposes. But what's important is that whenever I write rho c, this always means the conditional state. And if you want to recover the unconditional state, so the unconditional state, rho of dt, is going to be a sum over k over all probabilities times all conditional states. Right? And we can see that it will make sense because I have, you know, with this probability dk, I multiply this thing, dk's cancel out, and I just recover this. Right. So the unconditional evolution is an ensemble average of the conditional evolution. So this is a single shot thing, right? You do the experiment just once and you get a random state. This is single, very, very single shot. It's like one experiment again, you just get one random state. Uh, but of course, if you were to repeat this experiment many times, and by repeating, I mean resetting back to the initial state. So it's an ensemble averages. Reset back to row zero and do the whole thing again, you would get this unconditional. So you can always think about the solution of the master equation as an ensemble average thing, right? Whereas uh, uh, a specific unraveling is a single shot of the equation. Yeah. So with the dagger, you know, with the conditional evolution, are you applying the state of in the, the generalized measurement you talked about? Are you, are you updating the state for it? Yeah, yeah. So the way that you generate this is very simple. If you 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 Start with your to zero, compute all of these probabilities, zero, one, two, three, up to NC, uh, sample them, just you know, throw a coin in the graph ever to, to sample them, and then whatever you get, you do it like this. It's true that in most of the time you're going to sample N zero, and every once in a while you're going to sample this, but that doesn't matter as far as this is concerned. You just sample it and you do it in your gut. Yeah. And this is all for a single step. Of course, what we're going to do now is extend this. To a sequence of steps. So that would be the idea of continuous measurements, right? So we're monitoring the, the environment constantly. And so now we're just going to.
repeat the whole thing many, many times, right? So we can now repeat, for example, row of two BT given two outcomes, K1, K2. This is a conditional state. It's going to be MK2, MK1, row zero, MK1 dagger, MK2 dagger, divided by uh, P of K1 and K2, where P of K1 and K2 is always the trace of whatever is up there, right? So now I identify two measurement operators. We get two, two bits, right? The first measurement outcome, the second measurement outcome, and, and this is how the state should be. Did you specify how you sample, or is it just like a random choice? So you sample with these probabilities, right? So you, you need to sample with these probabilities. Uh, we will give the appropriate weight to uh, uh, both not only jump versus low jump, but also to the specific jump operator that you might have. So for example, if you have a qubit uh, that's already in the ground state, the probability that you get a photo going to be zero. And this is going to be consistent with this because when you apply the ground operator, the ground operator for emission, and the state is, the, is just the ground state, it should give zero. So the probability that you see an emission is system has no expectations is zero. Right. Okay. Uh, the problem with these K1, K0 is that the P, K1 has to be Are we considering that Right, that's a good point. Uh, let me actually write it down. So, so they're not independent um, uh, because whenever you do a jump, Right, you update the state somehow, and that's the state that is going to enter into the other one. So actually, what you can do is you can write P K one K two, and, and this is that I mean something you can always do, right? You can always write it like this by by Bayes' theorem, and P K one is exactly uh, this thing, right? And P K two given K one. Is going to be trace of MK2 row um, of BT given K1 and K2 dagger. So you use the state from the previous update and you uh, uh, sample your MKs. So, um, if you now do this, you know, continuously, right, uh, uh, for a long time, you're going to get a string of outcomes. Something like A1, A2, and so on, which is a KN, depending on how long you measure, right? And so this is your measurement record. It's a, it's a big string of outcomes. So it's actually a big string of what channel happens to go off at that at each delta p, right? Usually this big string is going to have the shape like zero, zero, zero. There's going to be a billion zeros because most of the time, you know, nothing happens, and then all of a sudden you might get a channel, a q, then a bunch of zeros, then maybe another channel, seven, and so on, right? So your your string is going to look like many many zeros with a few channels in between, which re represent the jumps that, that occur. Okay. Once we have this, we can build uh, it's it's a, a, a customary to build certain quantities, which I'm going to call uh, increments P and A of P, which are going to be one big uh, channel K clicks at time P, and it's going to be zero otherwise. So these are absolutely classical random variables. They're just, you know, binary things, which you get at one if you uh, uh, that specific channel case or zero otherwise. 
for the small increments. And you can use these now to count when you have a very, very long bit string. You can use this to count how many jumps on each channel occurred. So you imagine that uh, you're counting k equal two, then you can say that you know, after a time, whatever, there was seven or uh, nine jumps of time two, right? So it's, this is just a counting variable. This is an incremental thing, like a delta. But you, of course, you can define an integrated quantity. So you can define something like this, which is going to be, you know, an integral of d and k of t prime from zero to e, which is just like summing over, and this will give you the net number of jumps in each channel. Yes. Yeah? So you assume that you have unity detection efficiency. Yes. Yes. This is assuming, but it's easy to generalize. Yeah. It's, 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 it's um, so in, in the tutorial, we do talk about it. It's, it's fairly easy to generalize mathematically, yeah. uh, including the symmetries. But here, I am seeing after, even if you go to the same 95%, the factor, then after a couple of jumps, there will be a story. Then there is maybe another story that the function is improved because we just escaped to it. We put got some information missing or so. Which was going to go instead of very, yes, very much. And and of course the formula you can take that into account, right? Because it's it represents a Bayesian update, which essentially gives tells you the best get information about this case given your data record, uh, and that data record can include imperfections. So that's actually quite nicely because does, does it help if you would say well I, I find this is a, of course a problem if you want to really do the experiment. Would it help if you take instead of that a system where it only it is correlated? So then we have, say, the chance of 95% to see one, and you are absolutely sure you, do, you don't, there's nothing escaping. You can basically error correct this somehow a little bit by uh, choosing the jump of to this version, and then you are more immune against this. Those events, so to speak. So yeah, I never tried to do that, but I, I think I think we can do that. Uh, uh, it's just about like rewriting the jump operator. So there are several tricks that you can do to rewrite your set of jump operators that will take into account some of these things. Uh, yeah, maybe you can talk afterwards, but I, I never tried to do that specifically, but uh, I think one can do it. I think something on a similar note, or maybe it's not on a similar note, but it's something I've been thinking about sort of slightly differently is you touched it a little bit but this what happens if not all jumps are permitted from all states that would mean that if we know that, that, that some jump occurred if that then we know that for a specific that sort of until it evolved dramatically or something then we know that, that mm -hmm. another group of jumps definitely won't happen but if we didn't measure that, then we lose this amount of like, they, they, There's some interesting information that I know that's great. One could probably think about, but I'm not entirely sure how to do this. Yeah, no, so you're absolutely right. Uh, so the way I'm doing here, I'm kind of assuming that you can monitor all the jumps. There's a different way of writing things, which is a little bit longer, where you, you have a subjective character to say, you know, this, this is monitored, this is not monitored. And then what this is going to give you is a Bayesian update in the sense that, you know, given what you assume is monitored, it will give you the best guess you can have about the state given, given that information. So these conditional states, they are always Bayesian in the sense that they tell you, you know, what you can say about the state given the data that you observe. And so it's in that sense, it's, it's easy, at least mathematically, to assume that you, you have input to data and that will just make, you know, uh, make this a little bit more noisy. Yeah. Okay, um, I have until 1110, said it, or maybe a little bit less. Is it at 55? Yeah, okay. So I just want to point out that this, I think, is, is, a, is a, a very nice starting point because now we have something, we have a quantum dynamic that is happening, right? And this is your observable outcome, right? So this bit this string is what you actually observe. And now you can actually use this to build. Uh, meaningful things and meaningful curves. So um, suppose we want to count, uh, let, let's give an example. Suppose we want to uh, uh, have the qubit model where we have one jump operator, which is um, 
sigma minus, and the other jump operator, which was sigma plus, right? So one operator ejects a photon, the other operator inserts a photon. Suppose now we want to take uh, uh, um, count the current of excitation. So current is something that you know is positive in one direction and negative in the other direction. So we could do that. We could say that the net number of uh, excitations that was, was exchanged up to a time t is, uh, for example, d n uh, one, or I can even maybe this is a bit simpler. I can say this is uh, n one of time t minus n two of time t. And so these are just random variables. This is counting how many jumps of flavor one happens, how many jumps of flavor two. And if I subtract them, I get a difference. And so, you know, I attribute a physical significance to this, in this case, the photon curve, right? So by playing with these little objects, these random variables, I can construct physically meaningful currents, physically meaningful things, right? Which of course are, are very much model dependent. To give another example, suppose I am counting photons, and I have single photon losses and two photon losses. So suppose suppose I have one jump operator being some rate times a, the other jump operator being another rate times a squared, for instance. Right now, I could suppose I want to count the net number of photons. That is flowing. Right? So the net number of photons is going to be n one of t plus two and two of t because you know I know from my physical model that this counts as two photons, right? So this is the physical part. What I showed before was highly mathematical. So this is how you connect to real physics. You build currents by attributing physical significance to your jump operators, right? Depends on what you want to do. And you can do many curves, right? So any model will not have only a single current, it will have many currents. Another uh, 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 example is one thing called the dynamical activity. Which is going to be um, uh, just adding up all the currents equally. So the dynamical activity it just adds with the same weight all of the clicks, and this is a measure of how active your system, right? So you know how many clicks are happening. You don't, you don't care which channel is clicking, you just care about how many clicks are going on. This is all the dynamic activity, it's a nice thing to, to look at. Okay. Why do you remove the back of two bits? So I I mean I can do that if I want, right? So, I guess the argument that I want to make is that this has a different physical significance from this because this is counting photons, right? So it's assuming that this jump emits one photon, this jump emits two photons, and so that's why I'm going to choose. And here I'm not assuming that he, this is two photons, I just want to assume I have a detector that clicks here, a detector that clicks here, and I'm asking for how many clicks I get per second. Okay, so so more generally, I will, I can define the net number of um, uh, expectations up to a time t as some physical weights <clears throat> associated to the uh, each specific channel, and this is where the physics comes from. You know, it's whatever weight. This is model dependence. You know, given my model, I choose my 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 weights in UK. Uh, 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 you know, say to get a particle current, to get a photon current, whatever. This is the physical thing, and this is model the right? Once I have this, there's a bunch of things that I can compute. So the current will be the rate of change of this thing. So usually I call this charge and I call this current just, you know, because this is like a rate of changes, right? Um, there's a couple of results that I'll just uh, list here. Uh, 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 but we can maybe discuss afterwards just because I'm running a little bit off time. The average current is going to be sum over k, nu k, 
average of L K dagger of K. So if you just want to look at the average curve, you just need to average your jump operator times the dagger of K and multiply this by U K. You can also look at other things. You can look at the variance of N of P, for example. So that the uh, variance of this thing, and this will be uh, some two point correlation function. So it's going to be written like this. Where S of D1, D2 is a two times storage correlation function. Sorry, let me just write this as a classical average. I have the expectation there. So the only reason why I'm writing all of this, and I'll come back to this next time, is just to say that now we have a bunch of random variables, and we, it, it's completely classical. So this is you know, the realm of classical stochastic process. And then you can compute a bunch of meaningful quantities, right? Which actually tell us a lot about what's happening inside the system. So we'll come back to these definitions last time. But what is not being told here yet is how to actually extract these quantities from the quantum dynamics. So I just want to look at this formula for a second, because the thing on the left is the average of a classical stochastic process. And the thing on the right is a quantum expectation pattern, right? And this is kind of a similar theme to last time, where you're mapping some classical observable thing that you might measure in the lab to some quantum something, something happening inside your quantum system, right? And we'll also be able to do this for all the other quantities. So we can actually, um, um, Define a, a, the right formula, then easily computable formula for pretty much any kind of quantity that you want to, to play with. So the process here that we have is this this is the data, right? And everything else is post processing of the data. We just want to play with the data and try to find a meaningful physics from it. But the data that we get is just a giant fish, right? Um, so let me just show you uh, before we finish, let me just quickly go through a bit more of an illustration. So I showed this um, plot of a quantum trajectory. Suppose I want to look at the particle current, uh, sorry, or the particle charge. So it might look like this. You see, it's something that starts at zero. And I'm going to attribute a count, which is plus one or minus one, depending on which jump happened. So here, there was a minus one. It goes down. And then there was another jump, you see, like right afterwards. So it's zero again. Uh, and up and down and so on. And of course, you can imagine that this goes for a very long time. So we're just monitoring this and this will give you the net charge that flows, right? Uh, if you want to compute the average current uh, for this model, you know, there are simple functions to do it. Uh, you just need to say, you know, I want to compute the function that has these two jump operators and the weights that I want to apply is one or minus one. So this is the particle current because I'm subtracting, right? These weights tell you the physical current and you find that the average, the current on average, will uh, uh, be given by this formula. Um, and this now has a lot of physics into it. For example, you can see that there is a current uh, because there is a Rabi drive. So the model here is, again, a, a qubit undergoing Rabi oscillation, and it can emit photons and absorb photons from a single path. If there are no Rabi oscillations, the average current should be zero because the average number of photons you emit should equal the average number of photons that you absorb. But because you have Rabi oscillations, you, can, you are actually emitting more than absorbing. And so you get something here that is finite. So if you set gamma omega to zero, this would be zero. We could also look at the dynamical activity, which is just setting the weights to one and one. And I don't care about you know, uh, 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 what's happening. I just want to count clicks, right? And now you see that this quantity uh, uh, is not going to be zero when omega is zero, right? So even if you don't have a Rabi drive, things are still happening, right? There are still photons being emitted, photons being absorbed, right? And this is a continuous process it's happening all the time. Uh, um, um, and the dynamical activity will give you how many clicks per unit time you would be observing, right? And you can also compute other things. So if you want to compute the two-point correlation function, we'll, we'll go through these uh, uh, later on. But of course, you, you can compute any kind of statistical quantity that you want, right? So this opens a kind of a Pandora box in the sense that there are many statistical quantities uh, which are meaningful, 
and that you can play with and actually connect with experiments. So uh, you might have heard about the so-called global coherence functions, G1, G2. This will follow from this. I mean, for, for the specific case where your system is a cavity, for example, um, these quantities will be related to the coherence functions. But this is also holds for quantum dots and electron tunneling and so on. So this is a little bit more general, right? So there are many, many things that you can do that you can do with it. Um, yeah, and I think I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so uh, last time uh, we were kind of discussing also the quantum dynamics that understand the quantum theory. So I was just wondering um, how this could relate. Is it the same quantity that it's, I mean, it should be the one that's really happening? Right, right. So, so, so this dynamical activity here is it would be the dynamical activity of the observed jumps, and the thing that I was talking last time, which people call the quantum dynamical activity, it actually has a part that is not associated to observable jumps, which is somehow associated to unitary dynamics. And as far as I know, it's kind of an open question exactly what's the physical interpretation of that. But the things that, that appear in the quantum KUR would be that one. Uh, if you try to use this quantity for the KUI can be violated for quantum systems. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you for the talk. Um, actually, my question is do you know which of the, the multiparticle system, which of the uh, images are sending the photon out, or is this unknown? Is it, is it I, I didn't get it. So, is it clear that atom one has emitted or atom? Or is it just clear that you got a click? I think that would very much depend on your physical system, right? I mean, the, the model can can take care of both. So, so for this model, it's actually a single atom, right? It's, it's just a single a single emitter. Yeah. Larger systems. Yeah. Scale it up a bit, and then because then this uh, interference of different pathways plays a very interesting role. The correlation function also. Right. Um, and um, I don't know whether you go into this direction or not. What is the. Uh, because for a single particle, of course, on a jump, mysteries and so on are interesting to the view, but um, so yes, we are only looking for multi particle entangled systems and how that uh, is applied then in this case. And. Uh, Sure. Right. So, so I guess what I can, like, what I can say is this: um, if you want to consider, say, let's say two particles, just for simplicity, right? So two particles emitting, uh, you can consider. I mean, adding the situation where they just the emissions don't interfere, so it, they they count to the same click. So we know there's a detector that you, that cannot distinguish the two, but there's no interference between the emissions. I would say that that is almost trivial to do it here because you just need to add a. Um, your current like this, you just need to add equal weights to the emissions of this particle and this particle. So like building this by hand is super easy. If you want to have a situation where two atoms, they can emit and these emissions can actually interfere with each other, that is a little bit more difficult. Uh, so to do that, you, I think what you would probably need to do is you could also consider the bosonic modes and then consider quantum jumps of the bosonic mode and then allow them to But um, yeah, so I mean that, in principle, everything can be done, but um, it could be just computation complicated. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So I think um, we'll uh, stop here. I think, and then I think uh, Gabby.